Welcome to week 11 for our short little lecture. Glad to have you come back and hope that uh, you've had a good week. Let's go ahead and move forward with our PowerPoint. This week we're going to be learning about the Native Nations of the Northwest Coast. Pretty fun group to learn about. First, let's go to our study guide. Here's our study guide for week 11. And as usual, it has some yellow highlighted extra good to know hints for things to learn, uh, yellow highlighted with blue font. Some of the things that are on this list will also be covered today in our PowerPoint. And the film that you'll be watching is North American People of the Northwest Coast. And there are questions that you could review before you watch the film. And then there's a, a short article to look at and one more short video. This second video is very interesting. It's from 1951 and um, it was a video not videotaped, filmed um, in a very unusual kind of way. Usually people would not be allowed to make this sort of film, but the ethnographer had developed a level of trust where they let him film this. It has almost no dialogue. And uh, when you're watching the film, uh, it's mostly to just sort of observe and reflect what does it feel like to see this uh, dance going on. So we can look forward to having you do that later during the week. All right. So uh, the Northwest Coast could be confusing. It ends by the time you get to Southern Alaska, because when you go above here, then you've got the Arctic and the subarctic. So it's the people who live pretty close to the coast all the way from Cape Mendocino all the way up towards Alaska. It even goes through part of British Columbia. And the total distance is 1,500 miles. And it includes many lakes and many places where the water from the ocean goes in. Probably that 1,200 miles had about 200,000 people before the Europeans and Americans arrived. As in many other places, the uh, people in the Northwest, including the Cousins people, uh, worked year round collecting food by fishing, hunting, gathering plants, uh, and then preserving those um, items, especially things like dried fish, might be caught in the summer, dried, and then kept protected uh, through the winter. And each house, the houses were big, had an acknowledged leader uh, who could serve as the spokesman for the group. We're on the third bullet, just in case you got confused. I wanted to make it fun. There's two, here's three and four bullets here. Members of households were usually related by birth or marriage. So it's basically a big extended family in a big house for the most part. And they would share resources and jobs, domestic tasks. And they inhabited at least 70 villages that were along the rivers and bays. Some of the biggest houses were really big, 80 feet by 40. To kind of give you an idea of what that might be like, a classroom that you went to when you were a child, kindergarten through 12th grade, those are generally 30 by 30 feet. So imagine something that's at least three, two to three times as big as a classroom with many, many people living inside the house. That's what it was like then. Here's uh, another hint about your quiz. <laughs> two more facts that could be on a quiz. In contrast to foraging societies elsewhere in the world, they're usually egalitarian, which meaning everybody is pretty much the same uh, class or the same kind of people as far as how they're treated. The Northwest people 
had uh, three groupings, nobles, commoners, and slaves. And then over here, it's not a very good slide, but it does have a picture of a commoner. And it says the middle class composed the bulk of the Northwest Coast peoples. They lacked the prestige and privileges of the nobility, but shared in group activities. And they provided the labor that led to tribal wealth. Um, the second part, there was also slaves. And the second part's kind of sad. If you were a slave, you might get sacrificed when the person that owns you uh, dies. Or maybe for some other re religious reason. Potlatch are pretty famous. Um, people learn about these um, in anthropology classes normally. Uh, the potlatch was a huge part of the culture before European contact. Eventually, some of the government officials and uh, missionaries and so on, they became uh, unhappy about potlatch and they thought, let's get rid of it. And so for parts of the time, in different uh, Northwestern uh, Native people's uh, communities, it was outlawed and then finally, or underground because it was being hidden. And finally it came back. One of the things that bothered the Europeans is that things that during a potlatch items could be destroyed. People might not just give away things, which is what they're most famous for is the richest person in the community would have a big, big party. You would come and everybody would get something. Uh, and that part, you know, maybe if they weren't invited, the Europeans wouldn't like it. But the other part that they didn't like is that items of great value would be smashed or thrown in a fire uh, just as a way of showing. I'm not sure Europeans actually understood what it was showing, but some people thought it meant that the person was sort of showing off who was giving the potlatch. Others thought it was a way of them showing that they weren't attached to this these riches that they had been given by the uh, commoners. But at this point in time, people do have potlatches and they also have community meetings. It, traditionally, the community meetings were like some of the other uh, tribes we've learned about in North America, where everybody who comes to the meeting gets a say and nothing's decided until everybody agrees unanimously. And that's hard to achieve, but once everyone decides, then there's unity in moving forward. In the late 1800s, uh, a new church was developed that was called the Shaker Religion. And I'd like you to read about the details in the textbook. Uh, it goes on for a bit, um, but basically one guy had a couple of different visions. And in the second time he had a vision, he was shaking. Um, so that's where the word shaker comes from. And the um, religion still exists. And one of the ideas is to preserve the traditional beliefs interwoven with some of the Christian beliefs and to try to help people in the community, particularly if they have uh, drug or alcohol dependence. When you watch the first film uh, this week, um, you'll notice that the parents arrange the marriages of the bride and groom, which also happened when you, last week when you were learning about the plateau people. Uh, children learn from doing, by learning from their parents and doing what their parents are doing. So carving, hunting, gathering uh, plants, uh, creating clothes and artwork, they all learn from their parents. Another fact that would be good to be to remember is that each year when the first salmon comes up, uh, you know, salmon come every year at a certain time because they're going to be laying their eggs and then they die. So when they come upstream, the first one you catch, they have a celebration. And then when they eat that first salmon, the people return the bones from that fish to the water uh, as a thank you gift to this fish's spirit. And there's a boy in the film Don Alwak, who was very brave and saved the chief's grandson so that he got to marry the girl. I hope I'm not giving away too much, but it's important to remember what, what did that boy do 
that he got to marry this girl. He was brave. <laughs> and no, the film, you'll have, you might see a question on the quiz about Indians being killed by bears, but no, there was nothing about that in the film. In contemporary society, the Northwest Indians uh, belong to a lot of different religions. So some hold to just traditional beliefs, some have Christian beliefs or other uh, Eastern religions, uh, and some will combine these together, including the Shaker religion. Unfortunately, as we found in almost all of the other reservations, uh, native populations are have a difficult time with alcoholism uh, and poverty and unemployment. But there are some tribes that are using their resources to not only start businesses and to um, uh, help their community, but they provide uh, role models for youth and um, they work to improve the education for their uh, kids. Okay, great.